Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored to welcome to the show from the city of Kamloops, British Columbia, Councillor Nancy Bapel. Nancy, welcome to the show. Nice, nice to meet you. It's uh, Beppel, but that's Beppel, Beppel. I, I even tried, I even asked you that before the introduction. So, Beppel, I apologize for that. Uh, Nancy, I want to start with the question I've asked every single municipal councillor who's ever come on the show. So, you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? So, I wouldn't say I had it to begin with, um, but I play the banjo and that is core, I would say. Uh, probably about 25 years ago or so, well, I've played the banjo longer than that, but uh, I was playing regularly in extended care homes. And at the time, uh, the provincial government of the day, um, they decided to change how they were operating extended care hospitals. And the one that I was playing at was shut down and the residents there um, were sent to other locations. So I, I was really touched by how those individuals, um, you know, some of them were incapacitated with Alzheimer's, some of them weren't, um, some of them were, they were all very frail, but you know, out of all the people that were given a chance to have input into the whole situation of where they would be sent, and uh, they, I didn't think, had that opportunity. So uh, that really sort of touched me, and that sort of started my path in terms of looking at who should be heard when decisions are made. And I mean, I've heard from politicians who were in that government that felt that it was the right decision to make and that's fair but i still think that the people who were moved from say salmon arm which is where i was at the time to kamloops or even to another facility in uh, salmon arm uh, i didn't see that they had a voice in the situation so that sort of started my path in terms of being interested in politics and interest in policy that serves people. So it doesn't sound, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Nancy, but it doesn't sound like 
politics was something that was talked about a lot growing up or was it because you kind of come late to the the show when it comes to municipal politics because you just get elected in 2022 so where does the natural progression of how you go from working at that extended care home to getting involved in 2022 at the municipal level was there always the desire to know what was going on municipally growing up or was it more federal and provincial that most other people I've talked to say? Well, I mean, my dad actually did run for, I don't know the exact term because I don't think it was a city. It was probably a district. Um, but he ran for a council position when I was a kid. And one of my uncles was probably the term at the time was an alderman uh, for the place he was living. Um, way back in uh, twenty. 2003 or so when I was living in Salmon Arm, uh, I did run for school district. Um, I didn't get elected. And then I moved to uh, Kamloops and uh, I ran in 2005 for municipal politics okay. for, the council, for council in 2005. I wasn't elected, but I was the first or second candidate down on the list of the non-elected. Okay. So I was I was close. So then I ran in 2008. I was elected, and I was I ran in 2011, and I was elected. Um. So you, I, you've. So this is not your first term then, because I, I traditionally no. don't do a lot of research on my guests because my listeners and my viewers will know that they don't know as much as I know about my guests. And if I know right. all the information, then my get my listeners are going to learn from the people who are on this show. Right. Because when I was looking, I looked at the last two elections and that's the only two elections that I look at because I just right. want to know, did we elect it? And then were you reelected? But from what I saw, you were just elected in 2022. So yeah. I want to go back to that very first election that you ran in, in Kamloops in 2005 and then in right. 2008. I want right. to know, was there an issue going on in the community that you said Nancy's voice around the council table needs to be put there? Or was it many issues? Because we, we hear about municipal politicians being that one issue candidate or that one priority candidate for you what was the desire to finally put your name in the hat to say city council municipal politics is where i want to be and 2005 is where i want to throw my hat in the ring so 2005 um at that point i'd been in the community uh four years in kamloops so i i i would say it was a broad um set of issues uh, I would put myself on the political left and um, at least for for decades Kamloops has elected mostly representatives provincially and federally on the right um, but I think that there needs to be voices from all different perspectives um, and uh, so when I came to Kamloops I was just involved in all sorts of different issues uh, uh, in terms of like the health care issues that I talked about, in terms of water, in terms of uh, uh, nature. So it wasn't one specific issue, but I would say I was coming from a perspective of the left. Um, when I ran in 2008, um, there was one specific issue that uh, had a lot of uh, interest in the community and which I and another fellow who was also subsequently elected uh, ran on, which was that the city at the time wanted to build a hotel uh, on the waterfront uh, on parkland. And so we both, um, I mean, before the election, we were um, campaigning to stop that uh, process and the city eventually changed their decision. Um, and then subsequently I ran in the 2008 election and was elected. I want to talk about the jurisdictional boundaries that municipal governments have to deal with. I, I, I've been banging this hammer on this nail for a long time on this show. 
I think and I believe that there's a lot of people in Canada who don't understand the jurisdictions that the municipal government has to deal with. You talk about health care. Health care is not a municipal issue. While it's becoming a municipal issue, especially with doctor shortages and everything that's going on right now, it is solely up to the responsibility of the province. In your elections that you've ran and you subsequently have won, when you went to doors and you knocked on doors and you talked to the voters, were they talking about municipal issues to the municipal council candidates or were they talking about more federal and provincial jurisdictional issues? Um, well, I'm going to talk about the most recent election, which is in November. And Good, go for so it. I remember <laughs> I have the best recollection of what they talk about. And usually what I do is I just ask them what's important to them. Uh, rather than what they're happy with or not happy with. Um, in Currently in Kamloops, and I would say watching the news, it's probably across the province, maybe across the country. The biggest issue is the social disorder on the streets. Um, so that is many different things. It's people with substance use disorder. It's people with mental illness. It's people who are unhoused. Um, there's the crime that can be related to all of those things. So that if you want to parcel it all together, that was the number one issue for everyone. Um, not, I mean, the biggest issue. Uh, some people spoke of only one of those things. Some spoke of all of them. Uh, there were other individuals who had one specific thing, like they wanted the snow removed on this street better, uh, or they didn't like how yard waste was dealt with. But you know, I would say 80% were in the area of the social disorder. And you're right, it's that's the sort of, it goes across jurisdictions. Um, and in the, you know, mental illness is a responsibility uh, of the provincial government through Ministry of Health. And then they're designated uh, health providers, the inter interior health in Kamloops. Um, and then housing is also provincial through BC housing. Um, and then crime is, well, we provide the policing through RCMP, uh, but then there's the courts that deal with that. Um, and Which is then, a federal and provincial jurisdiction. Yeah. Is the federal in, in terms the laws. Of, yeah. Yeah. So, but the... the Do people understand what the municipality does? And that's the big question no, that I no, want. No, what they understand is they want something fixed. That's yeah. what they understand. Yeah. Um, so, but what I would say, the philosophy of the city of Kamloops is that things can be, they can be a force of bringing people to the table. So, and they can also like with housing, um, BC housing provides shelter and they provide affordable housing, but, the city can provide land. They can uh, be sort of supportive of putting shelters in different locations in the city, uh, because if the city just kiboshed it, then that wouldn't happen. Uh, the city can uh, bring other groups to the table because normally the uh, <clears throat> people who run the supportive housing is, uh, community groups or not not for profits. So that's the approach the city of Kam Kamloops has taken. I don't know what other municipalities have done, but is that we can sort of bring the groups together to make things happen. And uh, one thing in terms of the sort of street disorder is that um, the city has put a whole bunch more money in we have a new title for them. They, they, we, they used to be called um, bylaw officers. So yep. now they're called community service officers. Um, but one of the, I'll call them bylaw officers because that's more common term. The bylaw officer will go uh, out with someone from an agency, an outreach worker, to go and visit uh homeless camp and trying to connect those individuals with services because just 
sending bylaw officers in to clear out tents, those people are just going to get just moved to another location and they're just going to set up a tent down the street. So uh, city of Kamloops, I mean, it's the service agencies are getting their funding from the provincial government. So, you know, they should maybe be, uh, maybe it's a provincial government should be doing that, but the city is taking the responsibility of trying to work with the service agencies to um, connect individuals with services. I want to turn it to the role of the municipal councilor right now. And I want to start by asking this, because this is the important question that I think a lot of people need to answer, especially those who are, have been elected. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to be informed about the issues that are presented in front of you at the uh, at the, when you get that agenda package? informed on what the the wants and needs are of the community, but still understand that at the end of the day, the vote you make is your vote and you have to live and die by the yay or nay at the end of the day that you make. How much weight and responsibility do you try to put into making the best choice for the city of Kamloops? Um. You make a vote and you move on, you make a vote, you move on. Um, maybe in a meeting you would do 20, 30, 40 different votes um, for different issues. And it there's so many different types of things that are voted on. So yesterday we had a council meeting and we there was half a dozen or 10 different votes on land use, right? So either rezoning or development permits, a liquor license. So those ones, there's a there's a theme that goes through all of those land use decisions. And so in some cases, I wouldn't say it's being informed on that specific land use, but understanding the, the overall um, will of the community or the needs of the community. So right now we need more housing. So when there's uh, rezoning applications that come forward uh, that are looking to take a single family lot and putting four units on it, um, what I have to reflect is we need more housing. That's, that's a core need of the community. Now the immediate neighbors may or may not want more density in their area, but we have to weigh that against the need of the community. And also, you know, we can't just keep building off forever into the suburbs because it just is exponentially more expensive to keep running pipes down and building roads further and further out from the center of the city. So you, you, those you, ones... You, you... You have just brought up something that I ask a lot of people, and I, I I hate quoting Spock off of Star Trek, but I'm about to do it, and I, I enjoy doing it because it's a very uh, important qu uh, quote. How do you weigh the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Because you have to look at the count, the town, the city as a whole. You have to look at the entire city. You can't look at John Street or Sarah Street. You have to look at all streets. So how do you, as councillor, weigh the needs of the community against the people who have elected you, but also who have put their trust in you to make the decisions for themselves, but also the community as a whole? Um, I would probably say I'm about a 70-30 politician. So 70% uh, of my decision, I would say, is weighed to the community as a whole. And 30% is maybe for the individual. But I would say that I also try to think of um, who who might not be served. So is it's there's it's not just looking at the entire community it's sometimes it's saying who hasn't been served at all by the decision which is important uh, and is that challenging uh, 
No, I, I think it's it's oftentimes a, a, an example from yesterday's meeting, which I it hasn't been resolved yet in my mind, but uh, there was a policy that came forward and it was in terms of accessibility, which is great. So there was 60 or 80 items that the city will be doing to improve accessibility within the community. Um, but within the report, I, I didn't see a specific mention of people with mental illness who are a component of people who have a disability. So, so the things that they put forward, I think were great. They addressed a lot of different needs. My concern is that a specific group that maybe should have been included in that policy wasn't included. So, so it, it you can't always include everybody, but I think it is important when you look at a policy to ask yourself who has not been served by that policy. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to write down that quote because I want to come back to it in, in the next segment about the city as a whole. You are the government of proximity, as Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, would say. You are the frontline politics. The decisions you make are impacted the next day. Unlike the provincial government and the federal government, where it could take a month, two months, even a year, even a decade to implement some of the policy changes, you see impact the day after. And I want to know about the personal public life of a politician in a community like Kamloops, because the decisions you make I'm assuming you're getting stopped at the grocery store. I'm assuming you're getting stopped when you're out with your family, at the restaurants, when you're out just with kids. How do you balance the life of a municipal councillor who is the government of proximity where you want to ensure that everyone is being heard, but you also just want to be Nancy from time to time? Um, well, I, <laughs> I'm assuming you I get that question a lot. Well, I mean, I have some really good friends and uh, hopefully I'll, uh, we don't talk politics all of the time. Um, although you get, do, I think, tend to find people that have similar interests. So I do talk politics with some of them. Um, I go and go out into the outdoors and go canoeing and uh, cross country skiing and things like that. So that's sort of away from the grocery store, which is true. I mean, if I go and get something at the grocery store, I'm pretty sh sure I'm going to have a conversation. If I go to a coffee shop, I'm sure I'm going to have a conversation. But I know that, right? Uh, it's uh, so I can choose to go. When I go to the grocery store, I just know that uh, there's a good chance I'm going to have to talk to someone when I get my eggs. Is engagement a big priority for you? Because I, I can imagine as a municipal councillor, you want to be informed on what's going on in your community. And to do that, you need to talk to people. So does engagement come uh, come to you easily? And do you enjoy engaging with the people of Kamloops on the issues that are presented in front of them and finding out solutions that they may have that you may not be thinking about? Um, it's one of the best parts of the job. So really? Oh, yeah. Um, and I mean, engagement is oftentimes it's just being present. So it's it's going to a community event and just seeing what is happening. I'm going to a community event as soon as we finish this discussion and I'll be talking to people. You know, some people I've known for many, many years. I'll probably meet some new people. Uh, I know already that community groups has certain issues and I, I'm sure that they'll want to talk about them and I'll listen. Uh, but that, I mean, a lot of times it's just showing up, right? It's just being there and it's happenstance. So um, when I go to the community event this morning, I am 100% certain that there's certain people I will meet, but there's also happenstance of the other people that I don't even know who's gonna be there. And you get a chance because if if you're if you're not going out to these different events, you're going to be in an echo chamber. Um, there's there's certain groups in the city that are extremely well connected to city council. So chamber of commerce, 
the business associations, the home builders, those would be ones that I would say have a very strong connection with city council, but you have to take the time to go to the groups that maybe aren't on the radar or aren't as well connected. So going to uh, the St. Vincent de Paul seniors lunch once a week. Well, I wouldn't go once a week, but you know, go there. Um, the seniors show up once a week. You can go every few months and you have a nice conversation. I want to turn to my next topic because I just realized we're at the half hour mark and I said 45 minutes. So I'm going to get into the second te- segment here. And before I ask this question, I want to preface it by saying this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is her opinion. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is her opinion. We get a lot of emails about this question. I don't know why, but we do. Counselor, in your opinion, what is the biggest issue or issues facing the city of Kamloops as of recording this episode today? Well, the biggest issue that's facing our council is that it's it's not working well together, I would say. So I, I wasn't been, gonna I wasn't gonna bring it up until we, you did. So I will be we, asking we, about we, that in a few we, seconds. We've we've I mean, I can't even say we've had a rocky start because we're seven months in or six or seven months in. It's continually rocky. It's it's contentious. Um, so, and we've done a, a lot of good work, but um, that work is just is mired in the 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 uh, rockiness of the council. Okay, so I'm going to be transparent here and say that I don't lead questions. I did not expect you to answer, uh, talk about this, but here we are. And I want to know from you, from someone who sits, and I know there's uh, uh, council confidentiality about what's going on in camera, what's going on there. But from an outsider's perspective, it seems like there's some big issues going on within the council and it's spilling over into the media. It doesn't look good on the city of Kamloops. And I and I say that with respect because I think it's a beautiful community. I've been there a few times and I'm excited to come back in a few months, actually in a few weeks, but by the time this airs. How does how do you as a counselor navigate the issues that are going on with council with the needs of what's going on in the city? Because the needs of the city outweigh what's going on in council. And you have to respectfully sit in a council room with people and vote on issues that are important to you and important to your community, all the while seeing what's going on in your council chambers. How do you do that? So, I mean, first of all, um, the city as a whole is fantastic. I mean, I love your city. We, I, I'm, I'm we, so excited to come back. <laughs> so, so we have so many things going for us. It's the, I've seen different stats, but one is that it's the third fastest growing city in Canada. Other was, it was the fifth fastest growing, but anyways, it is a thriving city. It, we have that going for us. We also have amazing staff. So um, they are able to, like last week, we had 10 people from interior health in council chambers explaining their processes for uh, providing supports for, for people with mental illness and people with drug uh, use disorders. Um, the staff can pull things off. Uh, you know, when there's a flood, it's all hands on deck to keep the city from flooding, those sorts of things. Third is that um, there is sort of between specifically the mayor and council members, a fraction right now, but we have been making decisions and you have to, first of all, make sure that you get through the business of the day. I mean, somebody wants to build a house, they are investing right now in Kamloops a million dollars, I think. It's a huge amount of money. You have to invest in land and building to have something we need to make a decision and get it done so that they can move on with what they want to do. 
Um, and we need to make decisions on taxation. I mean, whether people agree or don't agree with uh, what the tax rate is, um, we have a certain level of services for garbage, for water, for policing, for fire protection. And we need to, as a council, agree what we're going to spend and make sure that it reflects what the community wants. And right now, I would say, you know, we've committed to hiring 10 more fire uh, firefighters. We've committed to adding five police officers per year. Um, those sorts of things are things because we feel the city as a whole wants those services, but there's going to be a cost, right? There's going to be a tax increase. Um, so is it hard to balance would, the cost increase with everything that's going on in the world right now? Because the cost of inflation, the cost of doing business is going through the roof. And when you put together a budget, I'm assuming you just went through the budget process last uh, earlier this year after you were elected. Yeah. Uh, um, is it hard when you look at the needs and wants of your community and understand that there is only one taxpayer and the issues, the, 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 the decisions you make around that council table will impact the people's pocketbooks and people are struggling right now. And you talk about the homeless population and the houselessness population. You never want to see more people get into that situation. So the decisions you make around that council table when it comes to financial and budgetary issues impacts people's pocketbooks. So how do you balance what's going on in the world with the the understanding that your community needs to continue to grow and the cost of business does go up? Um, Is it hard? I, yes and no. I mean, this this woman who I would say was in her 70s or 80s, I was up with another counselor and she went up to us and she says, no more tax increases. I can't afford any more tax increases. And that was hard to listen to because the, it's probably true. I mean, for her, she's on a limited income, um, but it's sometimes you have to think of, that if we communally pay for a service, it is, it is, more affordable for everyone. So we are a growing city. Uh, fire protection is something that is valued by people. Um, so as the city grows, we will need more firefighters. And so everybody has to pay for that. But I, I would say the, 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 there is only one taxpayer uh, scenario, I think, is a bit of a fallacy. Um, there's different ways that governments fund programs. So there's the user fees, There, there's utilities. So in Kamloops, we have a utility for garbage, we have a utility for water, we have a utility for uh, sewer. Um, we're just adding organic waste. So those are separated from the taxes. So those are sort of a user user pay model, right? You use so much water, you pay so much. You have a bigger or small garbage can, you pay so much. But so to play devil's fun. advocate, that 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 doesn't bring in the, the the significant amount of revenue that the city needs to operate. Property taxes is where that is, is it not in Kamloops? Or am I completely out, out to creek here with the, the, uh, the, the I'm, property I'm just, tax? In my mind, mind I'm sort of, I, I think that property taxes is about half of the revenue. Okay. And then there's the utilities and then there's all of the grants yeah. and funding from upper. And so you said, you talked about the president of the FCM, Scott Pierce. Um, and so I'm sure he's told you that we need another funding model in terms of the municipal government. We provide, we are responsible for uh, fifty percent of the infrastructure, I think, in Canada, and we get twelve cents on the dollar from taxation. So we we can't run cities without infrastructure. Um, yeah. We need roads, we need water pipes, uh, we need landfills. 
Um, but we have a very poor system for funding that, which is just through property taxes. So. Understandable. Yeah. I want to turn to my last subject because I am cautious of time here and I know you are a busy counselor. So I want to ask about my favorite subject and that is tourism. I love tourism. And I have promised everyone who comes on this show that if you come on this show, I'm coming to your community to spend my economic dollars in your community and hopefully grabbing a coffee in person with my guests so we can have a conversation, continue this conversation. So Nancy, in your opinion, what are some of the hidden gems that as a tourist and as list, I have listeners from across Canada and around the world, what should people be doing if they stop into Kamloops and exploring and touring? Well, I'm, I'm very biased. I, I, I spend my, I spend my time out of doors. So uh, there's some fantastic hikes around Kamloops. One of them is Battle Bluff. And it's not a very long hike, but you end up on a spectacular cliff overlooking Kamloops Lake. And you look one direction, you look east all the way through Kamloops up towards Chase. You look the other direction, you look down Kamloops Lake towards uh, Savannah. So it's just a spectacular location. If you're lucky, you might even see some mountain goats on the hike. So... So that would be one I would say. Um, and there's many, many other hikes around Kamloops um, that are just beautiful at this time of year. A lot of them are close to water, so you can go swimming as well. So so those would be some of the things that I would say. And then in terms of uh, in Kamloops, uh, there's a, a small, I guess you would call it a theater, the Effie. Um, e F F Y, and it has constant live music, open mics, uh, stand up comedy acts. But it's this small little theater uh, on the North Shore, and you can go there and uh, have some great shows. And just across the street and down the street, there's uh, sort of the brewery, brew pubs, and then there's some really great coffee shops. So I would say that that would be sort of a hidden gem because um, it's on the North shore of Kamloops and oftentimes people just stay in the downtown core, which is just a lovely, lovely downtown. But uh, those would be things to look, look for as well. So I want to end on the million dollar question. And this is the most important question I've asked all day. And that is in your opinion, counselor, Nancy, what is, the uniqueness that is Kamloops that makes people want to live, work, and raise a family in the community? Um, well, we have fantastic weather. Um, you can get to almost anywhere in Kamloops in 15 minutes. It's really well set up and I there's no traffic congestion. You can go downtown. There's dozens of great coffee shops that you can go to. We have a amazing symphony. We have an outstanding art gallery. Um, and we've got two beautiful rivers that run through town. So it's quite a beautiful place. Nancy, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I'm going to say this, and I say this with sincerity to every guest that I come on that comes on the show. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being part of your community. Thank you for stepping up and giving back to your community and serving your community with so so much passion. In our 45-minute conversation, I, I can tell that you're doing it for the right reasons. And I think that we need to say that to municipal councillors more and more. So thank you so much for stepping up and for being part of your community and giving back so selflessly in an arena that sometimes doesn't thank you. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Chris. It's, it's been enjoyable. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and sometimes it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. We'll be back again for another great episode. Until then, just keep talking.